Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's virtual dialogue. My name is Carrie Greif, and I am the Curator of Educational Programs for the Decorative Arts Trust. And it's my absolute pleasure to uh, share Isabel Rosner's uh, work with you today. She is a fabulous scholar, um, and you are in for a real treat. She will be joined after her presentation by Melinda Watt. Um, and Isabella Rosner is a third year PhD student at King's College in London, where she researches and writes about Quaker women's decorative arts before 1800. Her project focuses specifically on 17th century English needlework and 18th century Philadelphia wax and shell work. She received her BA from Columbia University and an MA uh, from Cambridge University and has been lucky enough to intern at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Colonial Williamsburg, the Fitzwilliam Museum, and the National Trust. Isabella specializes in the study of schoolgirl samplers and early modern women's needlework in addition to hosting the So What podcast about historic needlework and those who stitched it. Uh, so thank you so much, Isabella, and I turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you everybody for being here. I'm really excited to talk to Melinda later. So thank you to Melinda as well. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, oh, wouldn't it be good if I was more efficient at this? Okay. Okay, I'm hoping you can all see that. Great. So my paper is taken from a draft of a PhD chapter that explores needlework made by Quaker girls in and around London. That needlework, like the rest of the material culture I'm analyzing for my PhD, is highly decorative, despite being made by upstanding members of the Religious Society of Friends who advocated for plainness in manner, dress, speech, and decoration from their founding in the late 1640s. This paper endeavors to uncover the contradictions in 17th century Quaker needlework and to understand the reasons for these contradictions. It begins with an overview of schoolgirl needlework made in Hackney, the center of 17th century girls' education, before the founding of Shacklewell, the first official Quaker girls' school. This is to illustrate that Shacklewell students were immersed in a community of religious nonconformity and needlework extravagance. I will then present a brief survey of surviving Quaker needlework from 17th century London, placing them in approximate groups and explaining how their compositions make this grouping possible. This is to give you all an idea of the opulence and vibrancy of the needleworked objects I am discussing in this thesis chapter. The bulk of the paper is spent analyzing through the lens of what was considered valuable and useful to the mercantile interests of the Quaker community, the gathering of materials for Quaker needlework and the use of those materials in stitching. This analysis of Quaker needlework is, of course, object-based. I will be discussing a wide variety of Quaker samplers, as well as cabinets, work boxes, and needleworked accessories. These pieces are used to give weight to the claim that such decorative needlework was acceptable because of its usefulness. In the mid-17th century, Hackney was the center of girls' education earning the name the Ladies' University of the Female Arts. It is likely this area became the capital of female schooling because of its location and its population. By the 16th century, it was an area populated by merchants and aristocrats who desired easy access to London while still having the space and fresh air of the countryside. As the notion of girls boarding schools developed in the 17th century due to a growing interest in education amongst the middle classes and the increasingly common practice of sending daughters to other households for nurture and development, schools for the daughters of merchants and aristocrats were established close to their country homes. It is logical that many of these girls schools were run by non-conforming families, those who opposed the Anglican church, as Hackney was rapidly becoming a hotbed of nonconformist activity in the middle of the century. And coincidentally, it's also where I am talking to you from. I too live in Hackney 350 years later. What a treat. The two largest and best known 17th century Hackney girls schools were those run by Mrs. Salmon and the Perwich family. Elizabeth Salmon, the wife of Thomas, was a Presbyterian who taught French, housewifery, and polite accomplishments at her school in the village of Clapton from the 1630s to 1678. Half a mile away sat the Perwich School, a boarding school which was founded in 1643 by Mary and Robert Perwich, who taught music, 
dancing, romance reading, singing, violin, lute, harpsichord, calligraphy, accountancy, housewifery, cookery, handicrafts, and embroidery. It is likely the school ran until 1676 when Robert Perwich died or 1686 when Mary Perwich died. Much of what is known about the Perwich School comes from a 1661 book called The Virgin's Pattern in the exemplary life and lamented death of Mrs. Susanna Perwich, daughter of Mr. Robert Perwich. That text, written by Bachelor, serves as a memorial to Susanna Perwich, one of Robert and Mary's daughters, who was renowned for her musical and needlework skills. The Perwich family was nonconformist, although it's not known if they were part of a specific dissenting group, and if so, which group this was. What is clear, though, is that the two largest, most respected girls' schools in Hackney were nonconformist in nature, so it is not surprising that the first official Quaker girls' school, which I will discuss in a few moments, was established in the area. The survival of several pieces of embroidery made at various Hackney schools illustrates that they provided girls not only a thorough needlework education, but also a very decorative one. One of the Perwich daughters, likely Susanna, stitched a cabinet with the family's coat of arms on the inside and scenes from the story of Ruth and Boaz on its exterior. Three embroidered pictures and a second cabinet can also be attributed to the Perwich School due to their nearly identical stitch work and imagery. All pieces are worked primarily in queen stitch, a labor intensive stitch usually used for geometric patterns as it is considered too difficult to render figures, human or otherwise, with such a blocky stitch. Clearly, Perwich schoolgirls were taught to become expert needleworkers through the creation of elaborate scenes made of especially tricky stitches. There is one other piece of known extant needlework made in Hackney. A note accompanying a cabinet in the Ashmole Museum reads, quote, the cabinet was made by my mother's grandmother who was educated at Hackney School. After the plague in London, all the young ladies' works were destroyed, end quote. Hackney School may be the Salmon School as the school which took over the site of the Salmon School became known as Hackney School in the 18th century when this note was written. The cabinet, showing scenes from the life of Abraham, has skillfully rendered raised work and involves fine silk and chenille threads, metal pearl, seed pearls, and decorated metal feet. Clearly, the girl who made this box was taught a wide variety of stitching techniques and was wealthy enough to not only receive an elite education, but also to use especially fine materials in her stitching. I have shown you this Hackney area needlework to illustrate what was being made in the area when the first official Quaker girls school, Shacklewell, was established there. Needlework made by Quaker girls at this Quaker school is just as decorative, if not even more decorative, than what was being stitched at the area's non-Quaker schools. George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, established Shacklewell in 1668 to quote, instruct young lasses and maidens in whatsoever things was civil and useful in ye creation, end quote. Shacklewell took its name from the village in which it sat, just a mile from both the Perwich and Salmon schools. Luckily for us, at least two suites of needlework made by Quaker girls at Shacklewell School survive. The first, worked by Elizabeth Hall and her descendants, is owned by Whitney Antiques, Britain's leading dealership of historic needlework, and will be the focus of a book and exhibition in 2023. Rebecca Scott of Whitney Antiques has asked that I not share images of Elizabeth Hall's box before that 2023 exhibition. The second box made by Hannah Downs is at the Victoria and Albert Museum. The suite includes, but is not limited to two samplers dated 1681 and 1684, a work box dated 1683, two embroidered boxes, two matching pin cushions or tape measures, beadwork fruits, a hairwork pendant, a tape sampler, a single garter, and several purses made by Downs during her time at Shacklewell and in the years following, as well as pin cushions, embroidered pictures, needle cases, purses, wallets, and toys made by her Quaker descendants. The Downs and Hall needlework suites demonstrate that even though leading Quakers were preaching the importance of plainness, contemporary Quaker girls' art was flagrantly decorative. 
This was clearly the case at the school founded and often visited by the founder of Quakerism himself, but also at as yet unidentified Quaker schools, as evidenced by extant samplers, boxes, and needleworked accessories. Luckily for us, there are many surviving examples of 17th century needlework made by London area Quakers, but unluckily, there are many similarities and differences make it difficult to confirm which girls were taught at the same schools or by the same teachers. This is not helped by a lack of surviving documentation about these schools. Quaker teachers utilized some verses, motifs, and color combinations shared by most, if not all, Quaker teachers, but the order of those verses, motifs, and colors, as well as the inclusion of other inscriptions and images, was likely up to the teacher and therefore makes trying to group samplers together harder. Being able to determine who was teaching this needlework and who and where they taught would result in a more thorough understanding of the network of Quaker girls' education in the capital. But to give you an idea of the research I am undertaking for the first half of my PhD and for an exhibition and book co-authored with Rebecca Scott of Whitney Antiques, I will take you on a brief tour of some extant Quaker needlework and what we know about it. As you already saw with the Hannah Downs objects, and as you will see with this selection of samplers, Quaker needlework is just as bright, vibrant, and decorative as non-Quaker needlework. And what you cannot see in the images, but what I know from my handling these objects, is that Quaker needlework usually involves finer materials than its non-Quaker counterparts. The linen is more evenly woven, and the silk threads are brighter and more lustrous. Carol Humphrey, curator of textiles at the Fitzwilliam Museum and author of the book Sampled Lives, writes of these samplers, quote, the girls who made the samplers used fine linen and expensive silks, indicating that they came from families which were enjoying material success, end quote. I will cover the three groups of Quaker schoolgirl needlework that have been established thus far. Despite their subtle and not so subtle differences, their in level of intense decoration high quality materials and utter lack of plainness remains the same. The first group is that made up of the work of the Mackett sisters. Mercy Mackett made her sampler in 1688, Parnell Mackett her sampler in 1690 and her work box in 1692, and Elizabeth Mackett her sampler in 1692. Though earlier, Mary Wilmer's 1667 sampler and Elizabeth Townsend's 1678 sampler can also be considered part of this group. All five samplers consist of a top half of polychrome bands and a bottom half of white work embroidery and various needle lace techniques. They all utilize primarily green and pink silk threads and lack inscriptions beyond alphabets, makers' names, and the years the samplers were stitched. Second group is larger and includes samplers by Hannah Kolkup in 1687, sisters Alice and Margaret Jennings in 1692 and 1695, Mary Milner in 1694, and Mary Wilson in 1695. All of these samplers feature matching inscriptions in red thread that are interspersed between polychrome and whitework decorative bands. They all have a maker's name and year at the bottom of the samplers and all have identical bands, which include bands of grapes, Celtic knots and stylized carnations, and a particularly wide band I lovingly call the wiggly flower band. You can see it here on the screen. It's here and here and here. You'll notice the kind of wiggly branches. The third group is one I've just recently identified. There are only three examples in it thus far. They are samplers completed by Sarah Dale in 1693, Sarah Attlee in 1698, and an undated and unnamed sampler in the VNA. All three have a wide band of geometricized acorns and oak leaves. The anonymous sampler and Attlee sampler have the same verse, while the Dale and Attlee samplers have almost entirely identical bands. Other samplers have qualities from several of these three groups, and others have been proven to be Quaker, but are visually distinct and therefore stand apart from these larger groups. They include samplers by Mary Wearley in 1673 and Sarah Quare in 1700. While the Quare sampler also has the Wiggly Flower Band, the similarities between her work and others just mentioned end there. Evidently, 17th century London Quaker needlework is a tangle of overlapping and diverging inscriptions, compositions, and motifs, 
an entanglement further complicated by the fact that these stitching girls all lived within close proximity to one another, and many of them were members of families who intermarried. But as you can see, all Quaker needlework was highly decorative and used every inch of space to exhibit both a wide variety of stitching skills and a selection of high quality textile materials. This needlework is very much the opposite of plain, at least in our 21st century eyes. This ornateness was not the choice of needleworking girls themselves, Quaker girls, but also their school teachers, many of whom were chosen by or friendly with George Fox and other Quaker leaders. The contradiction between aspirational plainness and decorative needlework was not the result of schoolgirl ex schoolgirls exercising their artistic freedom or hiding this embellishment from upstanding Quakers. The Quaker needlework aesthetic was one that was well known and universally practiced amongst friends. While 17th century Quaker needlework is much more opulent than would be expected from a religious group so invested in the testimony of plainness, the society's stitching aesthetic is likely due to its usefulness. Embroidering high quality decorative, embroidering highly decorative objects with high quality materials allowed Quaker girls to learn how to use the goods produced, handled, and sold by their parents, future husbands, friends, and other members of the London Quaker community, the majority of whom were merchants involved in the textile trade. While the use of these expensive materials is logical, as they were readily available to Quaker needleworkers, their use suggests that mercantile success trumped religious practices. The occupational breakdown for London Quakers is not dissimilar to non-Quakers in the capital, but contemporaneous literature suggests Quakers were uniquely involved in opulent textiles. The clothes, textiles, and haberdashery London Quakers produced used and sold were famously decorative. Literature from the 17th century suggests that friends also wore their heavily ornamental wares. Although the 1689 book, The Quaker's Art of Courtship or The Yay and Nay Academy of Compliments is a satirical text about the Society of Friends, it helpfully demonstrates, albeit in a farcically exaggerated way, the wide variety and high quality of textiles used by friends and the breadth of truly unplain behaviors in which they engaged. Quote, if it were not for friends, how should so many thousand poor families be kept on work for the weaving and making of ribbons, laces, flowered silks, fans, feathers, visors, bulls, beads, nose, je nose jewels, farthingales, piccadillies, and the like, jewelers, tailors, lacemen, embroiderers, sword cutlers, armorers, gilders, picture drawers, fringe makers, dancing masters, singing masters, instrument makers, fencing masters, and in short, half the town and half the people therein might go hang themselves, did not friends support their trades and lay out their stocks for the maintenance of their families, end quote. Clearly, Quakers embraced ornate textiles and fancy sartorial ornamentation, but whether these goods were for themselves as well as their clients is not revealed in the Quakers' art of courtship. Fortunately, other 17th century writings affirm it was for both their clientele and themselves. At a 1688 Irish meeting, Quaker merchants, clothiers, and tailors contended with whether or not friends could, quote, make draft, figured, and striped work, or to sell such, or make them up into clothes, end quote. They agreed that it was, quote, comely and according to truth for friends to wear plain apparel and to make plain stuffs and to sell plain things and for tailors to make clothes plain. Friends would do well to encourage friends of that trade that cannot answer the world's fashions, end quote. The connection between Quakers and the cloth trades was well known in the 17th century and has been confirmed by subsequent scholarship. Simon Neil Dixon, in his 2005 PhD thesis, Quaker Communities in London, 1667 to circa 1714, notes that nine of the top 20 most common jobs amongst 17th century London Quakers were connected to textile production and use. The relationship between cloth and London Quakers can also be seen within the confines of surviving Quaker needlework. The Jennings sisters were the daughters of Isaac Jennings, a merchant tailor and occasional coat seller. Another coat seller was William Mackett, the father of the Mackett sampler makers. The list of examples goes on. While Anna, Mary, and Elizabeth Mackett carried on the family tradition by marrying into families also in the cloth trades, 
Elizabeth Hall, the daughter of a mealman, a dealer in flour, married Peter Collinson, a haberdasher. Many of the stitchers not from textile families married into families involved in the cloth trade, suggesting that even those initially outside of that community were preparing for a life within it. Intriguingly, in the 17th century and beyond, Quakers in the 17th century and beyond really tried to prove their needlework was truly plain. This is clear in Sophia Hume's 1760 book, Extracts from Diverse Ancient Testimonies of Friends and Others. In it, Hume collates 17th century Quaker writings and contemporary firsthand accounts, crafting a narrative of Quaker opposition to decorative needlework in the 17th and 18th centuries in both Britain and colonial America. A very abridged portion of this lengthy passage about needlework reads, quote, a friend on her dying bed, which was in childbirth, called to have the child bed basket removed. Take it away, said she, for there is abundance of superfluity and needless work in it. And though I did not do it, I caused it to be done, and now tis a burden to my mind. Friend H's grandmother, a schoolmistress, could not teach works of diverse colors, etc., but plain work. Lucy Bradley's mother, on her deathbed, left a charge. Her daughter should not learn fine works, but plain work and marking. Sarah Morris. Her mother would not suffer her children to learn fine needleworks of various colors, lace work, nor cut works. A certain friend said she once did a pretty deal of fine needleworks of many colors, but when truth prevailed in her mind, she gave them away, and since said she wished she had not, for if she'd had them again, she believed she should burn them. I visited Edmondsbury boarding school and testified against the works taught in it, such as tent stitch, cut works, etc. Esther Morris, in early time of friends, had a concern to educate children and proposed to friends to teach their daughters because of the danger of mixing with the world's children in schools. She succeeded and taught only plain works, marking, knitting, and reading, end quote. Hume's collection of Quaker writings about stitching is bewildering when one considers extant Quaker stitching itself. Early Quaker samplers, boxes, and needleworked accessories include a profusion of colors, superfluous stitches, lacework, and cutwork. Several of Hume's sources, as well as Hume herself, condemn cutwork, a technique in which portions of a ground fabric are cut away and the remaining holes are reinforced and adorned with embroidery stitches or needle lace. This is jarring as nearly every extant 17th century Quaker sampler includes cutwork bands, including the second sampler made by Hannah Downs at Shacklewell. The contrast between surviving writings and objects is disconcerting, especially in the instance of Downs's objects, as Shacklewell was founded and often visited by the founder of Quakerism himself. Fox surely knew what was being taught at the school and ensured that the school's teachers were staunch, upstanding Quakers. Texts like The Quaker's Art of Courtship and Extracts from Diverse Ancient Testimonies of Friends demonstrate that even though friends were often encouraged to dress plainly, not all Quakers heeded this advice. Although it is not possible to determine if Isaac Jennings or William Mackett were amongst the friends who sold unplain clothes and wore them as well, their daughter's extant needlework suggests that even if they themselves did not wear fine, fashionable clothing, they at least had the materials necessary to make it available to family members. The high quality silk threads, gold and silver metallic threads, tightly woven linen, and patterned brocade imply not only access to the finest textiles and haberdashery items, but also a willingness and even eagerness to use them. Where exactly did these schoolgirls get their stitching materials? Without surviving receipts or account books, it's impossible to say with certainty, but given the family businesses, it is likely their fathers used such supplies in their work or had relevant mercantile connections. Girls like Hannah Downs and Elizabeth Hall, whose fathers were not involved in the cloth trades, probably had close connections to those who possessed or sold relevant materials through wider family or London Quaker networks. It is possible that schools like Shackwell provided the high quality materials for their students for a fee and that they obtained their goods through Quaker haberdashers or merchant tailors. 
Speaking of Shacklewell, I want to bring to your attention a few additional Quaker made items that involve a real overabundance of wealth and materials, and that show that Shacklewell, founded by Fox and often visited by him and other Quaker worthies, was at the heart of this opulent Quaker stitching. The specific items are Elizabeth Hall's four embroidered nutmegs and both Hall's and Hannah Downs's embroidered boxes. I can't share the Hall objects ahead of their being published in 2023, so I have used an image of an embroidered nutmeg in the National Museum of Scotland instead. Embroidered nutmegs, embroidering nutmegs was not an uncommon craft amongst wealthy English schoolgirls, but most that survive were made into tape measures, not Halls, which are purely decorative. Hall, a member of a community preoccupied with plainness, not only made intensely ornate objects, she made objects that could have been useful, but were not. Her nutmegs were purely conspicuous signs of her family's wealth. Nutmegs in early modern England were worth more than their weight in gold. There was a 60,000% markup from their gathering in Indonesia's Banda Islands to their sale in London. Hall's inclusion of four decorated nutmegs in her box exhibits an amount of capital so immense that Hall could render multiple costly nutmegs completely useless by covering their surfaces, which were typically graded for medicinal and culinary purposes. Hall's four nutmegs are covered in embroidery to various degrees, but all include bright silk threads, metal thread made of gold and silver, and spangles. They are much, much brighter and involve much more precious metal thread than the example up on the screen. The use of excess material in Quaker needlework is also seen in the Shacklewell boxes. Both the Downs and Hall box exteriors are covered in laid and couched work, a technique usually limited to just the drawers or door interiors in non-Quaker cabinets and caskets. This technique utilizes more thread than other stitches as it requires larger stretches of thread to cover the entire ground fabric. Most contemporary boxes have exposed silk ground onto which seams and motifs are stitched, resulting in more limited use of thread. Liberal use of thread is evident in Quaker samplers, in which many bands include motifs filled in with satin stitch that are seen as just outlines in many non-Quaker examples. Such an exorbitance of material would not have been possible if this community of makers had less capital and supplies available to them. This extravagance in material adds another layer of contradiction to Quaker women's art. The Quaker needlework, Quaker needlework was highly ornamental, not only in color and design, but also in the amount of material employed. Friends needlework involved exorbitance in both the raw materials and the finished products. Perhaps, though, this excess was excusable because it, too, was tied to usefulness. Using embroidery threads on a variety of materials, from rough three-dimensional surfaces to smooth textiles, and a variety of stitches beyond just double running stitch, teaches girls how to handle a wide variety of haberdashery and textile goods. Gaining thorough, hands-on experience with the materials associated with the cloth trade was valuable to a Quaker girl, even if her family was not in the cloth trade, as there was a substantial chance she would marry into the trade or be linked to it simply because of her community's considerable involvement in it. Perhaps the thoroughness that comes with stitching in excess was thought to be a valuable way to teach young friends about London Quaker mercantilism. While much of the connection between Quaker needlework and usefulness despite excess is based on supposition and Fox's brief passage about the founding of Shacklewell, the inscriptions on Quaker samplers confirm that to friends, stitching, even in its most extravagant forms, was real important work that resulted in independence, knowledge, and piety. Even though the inscriptions do not specify exactly what kind of needlework is valuable, they make it clear that Quakers viewed stitching as useful. The earliest known example of a sampler inscription above about the value of needlework is found on ha Hannah Downs's 1684 sampler, the one she also marks wrought this at Shacklewell. The verse, which is now heavily faded, but was originally stitched in alternating colors at the bottom of a long narrow sampler reads, quote, when I was young, I little thought that wit must be so dearly bought but now experience tells me how, if I will thrive, then I must bow and bend unto another will that I may learn both art and skill. 
to get my living with my hands so I may be free from all bands and my own dame I then may be and free from all such slavery that comes through want of house, of house whiffery, end quote. This same verse can be seen on the samplers made by Sarah Dale and Sarah Atley, two of the three known samplers in the third sampler group I discussed toward the beginning of this paper. The verse illustrates an affiliation between needlework and livelihood, the combination of which leads to independence. Downs, Dale, and Atley assert that the art and skill that is required when stitching will lead to their own financial success, allowing them to become emotionally and fiscally independent. The verse suggests that being simply a housewife is so reprehensible and so devoid of freedom, it is akin to slavery. The verse, especially the phrases, get my living with my hands and my own dame I then may be, proves that Downs, Dale, and Atley, as well as their teachers and the Quaker community to which they belonged, viewed needlework as useful for financial reasons. Friends were seeking and expecting more from female Quakers than just being housewives. They were counting on women to partake in business. Another verse from a Quaker sampler, specifically that stitched by Elizabeth Creasy in 1686, also demonstrates the value of hand stitching. Elizabeth Creasy's sampler is similar to samplers made by the Jennings sisters and the Mackett sisters. So while it is difficult to group her work, her connection to London Quaker samplers is clear. A verse on her sampler reads, quote, look well to that thou takest in hand, it's better worth than house or land. When land is gone and money spent, then learning is most excellent, end quote. Unlike the Downs sampler verse, Creasy's verse was common in the period, stitched on many non-Quaker samplers, including several made under the tutelage of Judith Hale of Ipswich. The verse with the phrase, look well to that thou takest in hand, illustrates not only the importance of education, but that of handiwork specifically. It also suggests that education and handiwork can save one from unfortunate and unforeseen circumstances, such as the loss of capital. A final verse included on Margaret Jennings' 1695 sampler and a 1698 girdle made by Quaker Rebecca Eggleton links hand stitching to heaven. Both include unfinished versions of this verse, reading, quote, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own, end quote, on Jennings' sampler, and, quote, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works, end quote, on Eggleton's girdle. This passage comes from Proverbs 3131, and the King James Bible translation reads, quote, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates, end quote. Again, the value of handiwork is evident. While the Creasy verse focuses on the value of hand skills in life, the Jennings and Eggleton verse fixates on its value in the afterlife, ensuring entry through heaven's gates. While the works referred to in the Bible verse surely refer to pious acts and behaviors, there is also a connection to needlework specifically. From the 17th century onwards, needlework was often called work, illustrating the fact that stitching was considered labor instead of a leisurely pastime. Jennings's and Eggleton's stitched verse suggests that their own works are abstractly religious and literally needleworked. The inscriptions included in Quaker schoolgirl stitching illustrate that the community viewed needlework as more than an exercise in good breeding, feminine virtue, or piety. Friends viewed ornamental stitching as a job tied to financial security, independence, and devoutness. Quaker girls combined the usefulness of learning to stitch with the tactile expertise that comes with working with the material fruits of their community's mercantile success. To conclude, the contradictions evident in Quaker stitching, its opulence in design and material, are a result of mercantile success trumping religious limitations. Needlework seems to have been viewed as a way of bridging seemingly diametrically opposed organizing principles. Learning how to stitch did indeed prepare Quaker girls for lives and mothers, stitching and darning their family's clothing and bedding. And learning how to stitch in an extremely decorative way prepared Quaker girls for lives as active and knowledgeable participants in mercantilism and the textile industries. Needlework rendered female friends able mothers, wives, and business people. 
It's important to note before I end this paper that extravagant needlework was not just the purview of 17th century Quakers. It was not a mere blip in the history of Quaker women's art. 18th century Quaker samplers and embroidered accessories, including valentines, purses, needle cases, and pin cushions, are equally vibrant, ornamental, and refined. Such stitching migrated to colonial America with Quakers seeking new lives in Pennsylvania via Elizabeth Marsh, a Quaker who was educated in London and taught in Worcester before crossing the Atlantic. And other Quaker art forms such as wax and shell work were just as lavish. The highly decorative craft aesthetic established by 17th century London Quaker needlework was followed by the daughters of Quaker merchant families on both sides of the Atlantic for more than 150 years after the religious group was founded. Throughout this lengthy period, it was mercantile involvement and success not religion, that drove Quaker girls and women's art making. Thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce the hero of my life, my life inspiration, Melinda Watt. Melinda Watt has been chair and Krista C. Mayer Thurman, curator of the textile department at the Art Institute of Chicago since 2018. In this role, she oversees the global textile collection formed by a series of visionary department heads and leads the textile installation program both within the department and throughout the museum. Her first exhibition at the museum, Morrison Company, The Business of Beauty, is on view until June of 2022. Watt is also the current president of the Textile Society of America. Previously, Melinda Watt was a curator in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as well as supervising curator of the Antonio Rotti Textile Center. She was co-curator of Interwoven Globe, the Worldwide Textile Trade 1550 to 1800 in 2013, and she organized an exhibition of the museum's collection of 17th century embroidery at the Bard Graduate Center. The catalog, English embroidery from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 1580 to 1700, Twixt Art and Nature, was awarded the Textile Society of America's annual book award for 2008. She also organized a series of small focused textile installations at the Metropolitan Museum. These projects covered a diverse range of topics, including Renaissance velvets, 18th century menswear fabrics, and the textiles and wallpapers of William Morris. Her last exhibition at the Met was The Secret Life of Textiles, the Milton Sonday Archive, celebrating the former Cooper Hewitt Curator's Extraordinary Textile Research Archive, which was donated to the Antonio Rotti Textile Center. Yay. <laughs> Hi. Isabella, it's so good to see you. And you know, I'm so excited. <laughs> thank you so much for that very kind introduction um, with all those long titles. I know I should have edited it for you. Pleasure. Um, Loved it. I, you know, I'm delighted to see you. And I just want to emphasize to our audience today how pleased I am to be a respondent, discussant, um, collaborator in this program today with Isabella. Um, we've known each other for a long time, and I am just continually delighted and thrilled and, dare I say, proud of the really groundbreaking work that you're doing. Absolutely groundbreaking. Um, that is so kind. I am going to cry. Thank oh. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank we you. have, we, Isabella and I, and our very dear friend and colleague, Amelia Peck, have, um, we had some great times together in New York. Um, and we did, dare I say, um, a lot of really good work. Yeah. So it's the best. It started me on this whole journey. So thank you. And I, yeah, I, that's um, just the greatest compliment that anyone could pay to me and to Amelia is that we, we started such a talented scholar on this journey. So thank you. Um, I wonder, I think I know the answer to this question, but I wonder if you could talk to the audience a bit about how you came to study um, Quaker women's work and creativity in particular. Sure. So I feel like I've had a luckily and surprisingly very linear 
journey in my life. I was lucky enough to intern at a bunch of museums, including the Met, that um, gave me amazing experience with samplers and schoolgirl needlework. And that sort of launched my whole passion. Um, so what ended up happening when I was do okay, so I was working at Colonial Williamsburg as the Mellon textile intern, mm -hmm. and um, somebody emailed my boss, Kim Ivy, asking about a few um, pieces of shell work in the collection, these kind of massive dioramas. And Kim was like, oh, like, do you want to go handle that? Send some pictures, like, I don't know, see, see what's up with them. Um, and I was like, absolutely, yes, pleasure. And I saw them. I started researching in the museum catalog and discovered mm -hmm. that both of them supposedly had Quaker provenance. And I was like, that doesn't make much sense. They're so decorative. They're massive. They're huge. They're super opulent. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, and that kind of uh, flipped a switch for me. And I was thinking about how those pieces could be Quaker. And then also thinking about the recent work of Carol Humphrey, curator of textiles mm -hmm. at the Fitzway Museum. And that book that I mentioned, Sampled Lives, she has a chapter about Quaker girls and she had done all this work to establish the identities of a lot of these 17th century band sampler makers. And a lot of them were Quaker. And it, she recognized that some of the finest, most decorative and vibrant band samplers to come out of England were actually made by Quaker girls. And between that bombshell and the Quakers making these kind of gigantic shell wax diorama bombshell, I was like, I don't understand what's happening because my understanding of Quaker needlework and art making had always been, you know, the stuff that came after 1800, the kind of Ackworth and Shacklewell, sorry, Ackworth and Westtown and, um, you know, like all these sorts of Quaker schools where there was a very specific um, aesthetic that involved medallion samplers and extract samplers in a very specific, quite plain and stylized style. Um, I couldn't rectify those two things in my head. And that is what launched me into this. I was desperate to try to figure out what changed, how Quaker women's art went from being so crazy to being um, so incredibly stylized within the span of about 150 years. Right, because I remember you worked on several several Quaker samplers um, at the Metropolitan Museum in the American collection when you were and working. And it started it all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, well, I think what, what you've done with the Quaker samplers in the UK is, um, again, this is, this is all really groundbreaking. And I thought your interest in genealogical research and your pursuit and your success at genealogical research is something that hasn't been attempted to this degree um, in um, for the UK. I mean, we it's so much more common in American needlework studies. Totally. Um, so this is um, you along with Carol Humphreys and Edwita Ehrman who worked on the Judith Hale group. I was going to say, um, yeah, you know. working on these discrete groups is just is incredibly helpful. Um, you mentioned to me when we had our little practice session the other day that um, you made an observation about the nature of these very decorative works by Quaker women, but they were lacking an element that other needlework um, of the period has. Do you want to talk about yes. that? Sure. Um, I think it's a bombshell. I don't know if other people think it's a bombshell, but when I realized it, I was like, what is happening? Um, so if there are people in this audience who are also studying this, please don't take my one bombshell. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, no Quaker needlework from this period up until about 1700 has figures. So the stuff that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, the Perwich box, the maybe Hackney school box, right. all these kind of like biblical stories, huh, Quaker samplers, Quaker boxes, none of those things have human figures or even animal figures. The closest we get is on Parnell Mackett's work box from 1692. She has like a tiny little bunny and a tiny little butterfly and that's it. For some reason, for like, 40 or 50 years, there is a complete lack of uh, human imagery. And I, I have maybe some crazy ideas about why that was the case. Um, and I know this is, this is 
you know, something that you're thinking about a lot and something that you're working on. And I, um, I will also put in a plug for this is, this is the result of Isabella's years of work. So um, let's, we'll let her pursue this. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> but, um, you know, it does seem to me that you've hit on the way that Quaker, the, the one sort of distinction that this work is extremely decorative, decorative but perhaps figural work was a step too far. Yeah, and I have some uh, some interesting- but kind why, of, like, of course, yeah. I have some like kind of unhinged theories as to why, like I do wonder, and maybe I I'm thinking them. this. <laughs> They're like a little crazy. Like I was telling Rebecca Scott of Whitney Antiques this and she was like, that's insane. And I was like, maybe, <laughs> but you know, we have to theorize. Maybe I think this because I'm, Jewish, so I'm a bit biased, but there have has always been a really strong connection between Quakers and Jews, especially in the mid 17th century, when Quakers were like really out here trying to convert the Jewish population that had just been freshly was kind of in the midst of being um, rewelcomed back into England. They really were like, great, some oppressed people, we can also convert them, and there there definitely was that an is advantage. fascinating. Yeah fascinating and so weird like there clearly was evangelization no going on but they also there is a lot of early Quakers loved to liken themselves to Jews Margaret uh Margaret Fell mm. Fox who's considered the mother of Quakerism did a lot of stuff where she was just constantly talking about the Jewish plight and how they you know Quakers are Quaker women are mothers in Israel there's all this sort of stuff and I am kind of curious about a possible connection there Again, so crazy. Yes. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> no, but the, you know the the attitudes and the sense of um, being outsiders and or oppressed, um, uh, the nonconformists. Um, that you know, it, it seems quite logical that there could be other connections, and you know, other than they're not being participants in the um, in the Church of England so that they would share other characteristics. So that is, um, that's interesting. And I really look forward to um, hearing and reading where you go with this. Thank you, so me too. Is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not um, sure. <laughs> I, well, yeah, no, but it's, um, it, you know, that I think as we spoke the other day, um, the observation in and of itself is significant. Um, and I know that you yeah. will continue to um, work on the potential whys and the potential meanings um, for that observation, but the observation itself is, is significant. Um, you know, we talked a little bit the other day about how textile studies are, um, it, this is a relatively new scholarly discipline, and I liken the careful observation that you, the careful work that you're doing to you know, what has been done for, say, individual painters, where brushstrokes have been studied um, to identify schools or the hands of makers. And there's just such a huge amount of material out there. And, you know, as we know, there are, um, you know, when I was working at the Metropolitan Museum, I was responsible for a collection of 15, 16,000 different textiles. 5,000 pieces of lace myself, and there were more than four curators in the European Paintings Department working on, you know, fewer than 3,000 pieces. So it is, you know, this balance of, or imbalance, shall we say, of um, scholars to material. Yes, it's a different ball game, which is frustrating, but also hugely exciting. As somebody who's, you know, young and fresh in the field, it does give me an amazing opportunity to, to make really exciting discoveries. Like I talked about Susanna Perwich earlier in this paper. I was able to publish, you know, an article about that cabinet at like 22 years old, which is not a testament to my own skill, but to the fact that there is so much to be studied in the field of textiles and even more specifically in the world of embroidery and schoolgirl arts and there's just too much stuff for to, for not that many people to and not that many I people would argue to, it's a testament to your skill 
as well as nice. the availability <laughs> of and the possibility of making discoveries. Um, the, uh, and again, for, um, for our audience here, um, Isabella identified the Susanna Perwich cabinet at the LA County Museum. And wow, like that was a big moment. That was a Thank really you. big I moment. Did. There were like screams across the continent from New York to LA. There was like an immediate, very passionate email to you and Amelia. Very <laughs> lots of exclamation points. I did cry yes. at LACMA. I cried also in the archives of the London Metropolitan Archives. Um, when I like confirmed one part of it, I have Amazing. cried happy tears about it, like around the world at this point. <laughs> And you deserve, you deserve all those, all those happy tears, those moments of joy. Um, Thanks, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I think the Hannah Downs group, um, I found very interesting. And I wonder if you can quickly, I know we want to go on to some questions, but um, do, do we have any insight as to how that, um, I know there are different narratives for different groups, but how that group happened to stay together? Yes, well, yes. So the VNA has a lot of nice documentation about it and it passed through the family. Things like the Martha Edlin suite goes, you know, from mother to daughter to mother to daughter uh, matrilineally, whereas this seems to have just gone from like whoever is the oldest or kind of around or interested. Um, but it did get passed down through the family. And that object is fascinating. The Elizabeth Hall version of it also fascinating because I think it speaks to there's something, and I don't know if this is fair, and I haven't really spent that much time trying to figure it out, but there, there's something very Quakery about keeping everything. Quakers had really okay. good records um, mm -hmm. from the beginning, which makes my life much easier. And, you know, a huge, like a pretty big percentage of surviving 17th century band samplers were made by Quaker girls, which is shocking considering they made up like 1% of London's population it does suggest that there is a tendency to keep things. I don't know if that's just, you know, it, these people just tend to keep things and they all happen to be Quaker or if there is a kind of like community wide kind of desire and effort to preserve things. Um, but it, yeah, Hannah Downs is not the only one. Elizabeth Hall, that yeah. suite is basically exactly the same, actually a bit more thorough, but it's a has a, about a hundred years of these girls wow. stuff and they all just used the box as a as a way to store it right right so Delight. 2023 as soon as you have a date for the exhibition let us know everybody come to England it's going to be a great time it is going to be a rousing festivities I will also say that this year's and I'm promoting it because I'm involved but also I think if Fair people enough. are interested thank you if people are interested mm -hmm. in Quaker needlework this year's exhibition is featuring a lot of never before seen Quaker needlework. Um, and there will be a book accompanying it. Autumn, 2022. Great, yeah. great. <laughs> Thank you. I want to echo Melinda's praises. Your scholarship is fabulous. I don't uh, want to keep you both beyond what you've already been so generous with your time. So I'm going to try to um, get to a few of the questions that we've had here in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, the first one's from Melissa Irma, Irma okay. and she's asking um, uh, when and where the Quaker girls would wear these rich and ornate textiles. This is like, an ins this is a question that haunts me all the time, to be honest, because throughout Quakerism, there is all of this decoration, whether it's super uh, opulent, like this early stuff, or then really stylized, like the medallions. Um, they don't appear in clothing. They just don't appear in clothing. Certain parts of these, these needlework suites, these bags would have been used as bags uh, in real life. The medallions were likely used um, as kind of like, it, they were likely used in like clothing accessories. That's later in my thesis. Um, they just don't appear later. And interestingly, um, that is not, only Quakers. Uh, all these 17th mm -hmm. century schoolgirls who were stitching this stuff were making crazy yeah, yeah. pieces of needlework. And then what were they doing with, they, they, that stuff never really seems to have translated into, into clothing. Yeah. 
I'm glad that Melinda is nodding. Completely it, agree. Completely agree. It is um, shocking and haunting. You see this unbelievable examples of white work, and you think there must have been this vast English uh, needle lace industry, uh, cut work industry. No. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's right. part of the educational process um, mm -hmm. that it is not necessarily, these decorative works are not necessarily intended to have a function other than education and then to a, as a physical manifestation of a young woman's education. Totally. This, thank you for the affirmation. I appreciate it a lot because it haunts me, honestly, the, the mm. lack of, we have so much stuff from these girls, but we have very little in terms of clothing. And we also have very little of women in the home, unless, you know, it gets complicated. What was made by a professional, what was made by a woman in a domestic setting, but still it's very spooky. Yeah. professional amateur what was functional what was decorative those are questions that um I, we don't think i don't think we have modern parallels and i think there's a little bit of we have difficulty understanding and explaining that um these pieces of needlework didn't have a function they weren't they weren't garments they weren't bags totally. they weren't accessories they were a display of education and wealth I agree. Yeah. So um, to follow up with another question that I think will be a, a quick one, um, Melissa Aram also asked if there were any Quaker sample books you would recommend. So there are no books on Quaker samplers from about, you know, Ackworth and Westown mm -hmm. when Ackworth was founded in 1779, Westown in 1799. Hopefully a future book maybe written by me at some point will be about early Quaker samplers. I don't know. Um, this, the book that will accompany the Whitney Antiques exhibition will have quite a few sample, uh, quite a few chapters about Quaker samplers. Carol Humphrey, uh, her book Sampled Lives has a chapter about it as well. Um, and then there are later books about Ackworth and Westtown, including Mary Brooks, who I think is in this chat right now, hello, um, wrote a great book about Westtown samplers. So later Quaker samplers starting about 1799. And she gives a really good overview of not only what was being made by Quakers later, but kind of what influenced that aesthetic. I hope that was quick. I'm working That's on being great. quick. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, and there's a few questions about connections between the Quaker girls that you focus on um, and you know the work of New England schoolgirls, 19th century beaded watch chains specifically. And then there's a question about the connection between Shacklewell and Ackworth and if there was any connection <gasps> there. Okay, so there are lots of connections. Um, some I am keeping very much a secret right now because mostly because I actually haven't researched it enough to really understand what's going on. But there are lots of things that have very strong visual similarities that are making me be like, oh, I wonder why that is. Um, connections between Shacklewell and Ackworth, it's like a bit too distant in terms of time. So Shacklewell founded in 1668, Ackworth in 1779. Um, so there are many, many generations in between there, all the people who taught at Shacklewell, and we know a few of them died, like, obviously within the 17th century, we don't know who taught afterwards, we have very little information about who was actually teaching, and therefore can't really talk about um, who, you know, any connection between Shacklewell and Ackworth in terms of students or teachers, there also is a difference in the schools, it seems, between in terms of motivations. Ackworth was founded for poor friends, and from the beginning they were very actively promoting plain needlework. And I realize there's a question about plain needlework in the Q&A section, so I'll just briefly say plain needlework, it doesn't really get defined in like documentation until the 18th century. Mm -hmm. By the 19th century, plain work is things like what we would call marking. So you're doing things like Okay, you're darning because that's going to be useful, but you're also doing things like stitching your name and stitching letters and stitching out like numbers so you can have a have a life stitching names and numbers on home goods on linens on undergarments and um, in the 17th century so Ackworth was for served a very different purpose than Shacklewell is basically the the summary of all of this, but there are many connections that I'm working through that uh, do exist that I haven't yet figured out how the connections happen yet. 
No, that's very exciting. And um, I will say this has been uh, one of the most enthusiastic Q and A's we've had of late. Um, and- Good job, everyone, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do have to wrap up. Um, if you have a burning question and you just need Isabella to answer it, or you would love to be in touch with her, please email me, Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E at decorativeartstrust.org um, and I will connect you both. So, so please, if we didn't get to your question, don't feel as though um, you are without an outlet, just, just reach out and I will make sure that um, you are able to get in touch. Uh, and I, and I uh, can't thank you uh, both enough, Melinda, for your incredible career and expert scholarship and Isabella for your uh, amazing emerging research. And I can't wait to see all that you continue to accomplish um, in the field of textiles. It's really amazing. So thank you both so much uh, for joining us and um, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. So thank you so, thank you thank you so much. Invitation. And thank you, Melinda. You are my hero. Thanks for doing this with me. Oh, and Isabella, you, you are quickly becoming the hero of many people. So <laughs> I'm going to cry again. I'm so like, I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> so good to see you. Thank you, Carrie, you for too. facilitating the program. Yes, thank you. thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>